as I stood in a deserted lot in Chicago on a dreary November day, taking in my surroundings, I felt the icy wind bite me. As the relentless wind swept through the lot, little pieces of glass, wood, and soot-stained drywall scattered across the ground, and fragments of lightweight rubbish skipped through the air. It occurred to me that the sight perfectly portrayed my life at the time, a charred, lifeless husk of its former self, a symbol of isolation, resentment, and disappointment. I persisted in thinking about what I could do with the little that was left while kicking at a piece of concrete. A few weeks after turning 29, I met Olivia at a charity event. I was basically the second in command of the family retail business at the time, and my great uncle Seth, the chief shareholder and CEO, told me to go represent the company, meet new people, and maybe even drum up some business. Characters who thought they were on par with Mother Teresa because they were trying to raise a few thousand dollars to construct a local library made the event extremely dull and full of theatrical, self-important characters. She slithered into the seat beside me, grinned ear to ear, and began talking as if we were old friends while I pretended to be cordial by nodding and smiling absent-mindedly biting my tongue until it nearly bled and desperately hoping, somehow, for an opportunity to leave early. Olivia was a beautiful, slender, brown-haired, bronze-skinned beauty who exuded confidence and made conversation flow easily. As a result, I found myself suddenly enjoying the event. I've never been at ease in social settings, but I've always been a reasonably driven and competitive guy when it came to school, business, and sports. I had a hard time gaining any sort of experience with women because I had been really committed to my profession since business school and because I am naturally socially uncomfortable. I was so timid as a result that I rarely asked women out on dates unless we had known each other for a long time. However, I couldn't resist Olivia and had asked her out to dinner by the evening's end. I was pleasantly surprised to find that we had many interests in common and a plenty of conversational material. As a result, we had a fantastic day. It was obvious that we would be spending a lot of time together when I brought her home since I fell head over heels for her and it seemed like she felt the same way. As our romance gained steam, we went on sporadic dates for a few months. Before we knew it, we were seeing each other multiple times a week and necking quite a bit on each outing. I was unsure of what to do next, to avoid hurting her feelings or permanently scaring her, even though I liked her and was somewhat interested in having sexual relations with her. Olivia once unzipped my pants and dragged me into the house by the one limb I was sure to follow instead of kissing me goodnight outside her front door, making it obvious that she thought I was dragging my feet too much. Though I had little sexual experience, I was far from virginal and I had always assumed that sexual desire was exclusively a man's domain. Olivia wasted no time dispelling that idea from my head. By the time we finished riding, I was really exhausted. She made a mechanical bull look mild in comparison. At that moment, it was the most fun I had ever had doing anything. As our bond grew stronger, we began to experience more frequent and easier acts of intimacy after that. Just over a year after our first meeting, we tied the knot and we were living together in no time. Life was great once we moved into a four-bedroom house in a lovely, tree-lined area, did some landscaping, and got a dog. Married life was perfect for me in almost every way. It finally put an end to a form of loneliness I had been avoiding facing, provided me with unwavering emotional support allowed me to experience the physical pleasure of meaningful sex and allowed me to love and be love. I got more than I could have hoped for. Naturally, there were a few problems. Olivia was a little put out by my availability and, I suppose, a few other behaviors because I was always a bit overworked at work. Of course, I also found some aspects to be annoying. Perhaps the most significant problem was the excessive amount of time we were required to spend interacting with her relatives. Please understand that I had no ill will against her family. On the contrary, 
I found them to be decent, kind, and otherwise pleasant people. I simply did not wish to spend an inordinate amount of time with them. Her parents were a warm and inviting pair who seemed to like me. Nonetheless, they frequently lectured us on life values and put pressure on us to start a family. I didn't get really irritated because we weren't around for very long, so it wasn't a big deal. Mindy, her younger sister, and her husband caused me a bit more trouble. Mindy resembled Olivia in height and build, although she was shorter and stockier. When Olivia was around, she never strayed more than a few minutes from her side, and she dressed and talked just like Olivia. We spent a lot of time together because she and her husband lived within 15 minutes of us. They were like virtual Siamese twins, constantly chatting, laughing at inside jokes, and secretly plotting something. It was quite annoying that she wasn't truly with me when she was with Mindy, even though I suppose it could have been due to jealousy. There's probably nothing wrong with that. Even Mindy's spouse failed to improve the situation. Bruce was a tall, handsome man who was easygoing, sociable, and, in my opinion, not very intelligent. His favorite, and oftentimes only, subject of conversation was the furniture company in Joliet that he had inherited from his family. He boasted about the store's impeccable management and the fact that no one else in the furniture industry could compare to him as if it were Microsoft and he were Bill Gates. I thought anyone with even a passing understanding of business would have guessed that Bruce was somewhat to blame for the store's struggles. So that was the problem with that perspective. But I wished for Harmony and Olivia's happiness, which included maintaining amicable relations with her family. As a result, I sat through numerous nights mindlessly nodding my head to Bruce's endless droning. Olivia initially requested me to provide a hand to Mindy and Bruce after we had been married for about two years. She had prepared an elaborate supper complete with candles, soft music, and an outfit that suggested a fulfilling night in bed, so I assumed, as any inexperienced spouse would, that she was simply hoping for a wonderful role in the hay with me. However, her true intentions became apparent as the night progressed. She couldn't stop gushing about our good fortune and how we could really make a difference in people's lives because of our high salary. She continued by admitting her concern for Mindy and Bruce, who were barely surviving, while feigning distress. Bruce was unable to complete his floor inventory without assistance, and he was also in debt and unable to make his payments. I skipped the boring part and got right to the point because I could see where this was going. How much do they want Liv? I could tell I had interrupted her lecture because she paused and arched her eyebrows. She glanced timidly into my eyes after chewing her lip for a moment, clearly pondering, he needs 50 or 60,000. That would make them free and clear. Almost choked. We were doing okay, but there was a huge hole in our emergency fund because most of my money was in a family trust. Even while I was aware that the trust could be used to access funds in an emergency, I was not looking forward to having to explain this to Bernie Blackman, our primary business attorney, who was also responsible for the trust. He'd comply with my requests, but I'd be sure he'd be after me for a long time to recover the funds. He was merely doing his job of safeguarding the trust funds and the company with the utmost seriousness. He was not a badass. As I reflect on this, I realize that it was one of the rare occasions during our marriage when I attempted to decline Olivia's serious request. I don't know, Liv. That's a lot of cash. And scowl spread across her face. Mindy says he's got some great ideas and that they will pay it back right away. They're good for the money, if that's what you're worried about. I'm sure of that. Honestly, I had my doubts regarding that. Actually, I was quite sure that sending the money to Bruce would be like pouring money down the drain, but I wanted Olivia to be happy. So I wrote a check for $60,000, firmly informing Olivia that we would have to cut back until the money came back. Now, I once heard that when you lend money to relatives, you should expect to never see it again. In the event that they fail to repay you, that will set you up emotionally 
so that your relationship does not suffer. Therefore, I considered this a gift. A $60,000 bequest to Olivia's sister and her rather inept brother-in-law, which I didn't believe would help them out much. Even with the money, I didn't think he was a good enough businessman to save their store. Although I was unhappy, I felt compelled to play the role of the nice man for her and her family. I kissed 60 grand away in the hopes that they would like me. Around three or four months subsequent to lending Bruce the funds, I found myself at home searching for a thumb drive containing crucial data. I was basically searching the entire house because I had a terrible tendency of putting critical stuff in strange places by accident. I went into the guest room and looked under the bed, around the desk, and wherever else I usually look after I've exhausted all the usual suspects. As I rose to my feet, I could see that everything was more jumbled than I had imagined and abnormally bumpy, at least according to Olivia's domestic standards. The sheets and covers had obviously been pulled up in a rush, as if someone had slept in it. At the moment, it didn't seem like much, but I brought it up in passing that night while talking to Olivia. Hey... Was someone sleeping in the guest bed? I went in there earlier and it was pretty rumpled. Olivia was anxious and flushed as she began to mumble out a response. Oh, ah, uh, well, I mm, took a nap in there earlier. Sorry, I was doing some cleaning and got so exhausted I just jumped into the bed and didn't have a chance to clean it up any. I had complete faith in Olivia's explanation at that stage of our marriage. I never once considered the possibility that it could have been anything other than the truth, as revealed by God. Actually, I do recall finding it amusing that she would feel anxious or ashamed to admit that she needed to snooze midday. I failed to notice more than just the blanket. Olivia wasn't exactly a model of virtue, according to a number of other strange, unexplained events that transpired over the following year or so. However, I was too busy to pay attention. For instance, I believed it to be gospel that her ordinarily low-key position as assistant manager at a tiny independent bookstore now demanded that she attend a weekly uninterrupted meeting lasting five or six hours, a meeting so crucial that I should refrain from contacting her at all costs while it was going on. The small bruises that appeared on her body, some in really private areas, and the undressed undergarments that I couldn't locate were also explained to me in every way imaginable. Next, there came the orange juice incident. Olivia had begun frequenting a new posh supermarket, which was okay in and of itself, but meant she couldn't obtain many of my favorite products, including the orange juice I loved. After I voiced my displeasure and requested that she return to the old store, she adamantly maintained that the new one was superior and much more convenient for her, being conveniently located on her way home from her Tuesday meetings. Her preferred grocery stores may not appear to be a strong indicator of infidelity at first glance, but it was this piece of information that made me stop and think, and it was the catalyst for the realization that crushed my heart. It was less than two years after the initial loan that Olivia began dropping hints that Bruce and Mindy might want additional funding. He still hadn't recouped a dime of the initial $60,000, and I was wary of parting with any more money, especially for what I saw as an unsustainable business. So, in the hopes that she would finally get the idea and quit asking, I disregarded Olivia's proposal. However, she persisted and implied that Mindy and Bruce risked losing the company if they were unable to acquire additional merchandise and improve. Since I was still attempting to maintain my image as Mr. Popular, I felt I couldn't say no, so I consented to review Bruce's business strategy and visit his store to get a feel for his intentions. After I confirmed it was a poor investment, I thought Olivia would leave it go. On a Monday morning, I visited Bruce at his store. As usual, his exuberance had no bounds. He toured me around, introduced me to the staff, and greeted everyone we spoke to with a smile and a pat on the back, as if we were best friends. With conviction and conviction, he detailed his business strategy 
claiming that the store could quickly turn a big profit with a little extra capital to boost inventory and make a few renovations. After a half hour of sitting down in his office, Bruce and I discussed my concerns. I told him that I thought the company had some serious issues in the most courteous way possible. Even with all the improvements he wanted to make, I said that he wouldn't be able to attract more customers or make more money unless he could simplify and reduce pricing and costs. I even delicately proposed that he think about selling the business and taking on other employment, but he was quite defensive and kept insisting that a cosmetic makeover would be all it needed to get things back on track. I felt bad about Flat, out declining his cash request, so I explained that I couldn't lend him that much money from my own savings and would have to use the trust instead. I informed him that I would return to speak with Bernie in order to facilitate a loan, but that I could not provide any guarantees. I intended to keep things amicable by giving the impression that I was trying my best to get the money for him before I broke the bad news. And then, I would basically blame Bernie when we told him, no, I know it was brave of me, but I didn't want to risk losing that much money, and I wanted to avoid causing friction in the family. I had always made it seem to everyone I knew that Bernie was obligated to maintain a firm grip on the trust and that I couldn't override his judgments, even though in reality, he would essentially do my bidding. Making Bernie seem to be the villain may sound unfair, but I really believe he enjoyed playing the part and never once complained to me about it. Bruce gave me the sense that he was going to acquire the loan when he nodded his head and smiled broadly at the end of our chat. As I walked away, he shook my hand firmly and patted me on the back once again, which only served to heighten my sense of shame. Leaving the parking lot and heading towards the interstate, I reflected on my encounter with Bruce and attempted to mentally cleanse myself of the transgressions of timidity and almost deceit that I had just performed in his store. It started out as a strange coincidence, but it soon turned into a strangely unsettling idea as I was driving along, mostly oblivious to my surroundings. It was a green grocery shop, not as huge as the other chains, with a big Salvador's sign out front. I thought I'd never seen anything like it before because of how strange it looked. But then I remembered a name that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I thought about it for a while before it clicked. Salvador's was the name of the store Olivia had begun shopping at. The one that was so much easier to get to, yet didn't have my favorite orange juice. Unless, of course, she was at the furniture store it made no sense that this store would be convenient for her Tuesday activities because it was far from her workplace, our house, or any place, else she may reasonably have to be during the week. Some disturbing possibilities started to pop into my head as I thought about it. Seated in Bruce's parking lot for a few minutes, I drove past Salvador's and back to Bruce's furniture store after taking a U-turn. After making sure this was the sole Salvador's in Chicago using my cell phone, I lost 15 or 20 minutes to speculation about why she would be shopping there. I wondered if Olivia may be visiting a nearby fitness club, having lunch with Mindy, or working out at one of her company's other offices. However, I couldn't escape the thought that kept leading me back to the unpleasant reality. Suddenly, I was hungry for additional details and I wanted them now more than ever before. So I resolved to tackle Bruce Head. I hurriedly got out of my car and made my way quickly to the furniture store's front door. As I peered through the glass, I saw that they were open until eight on weekdays, except Tuesdays when they closed at noon. Just moments ago, a malignant suspicion began to take root and spread. I pounded on the door, stormed inside the store, and headed straight for the first employee I spotted, a middle-aged man who seemed rather listless as he stirred a cup of coffee. Excuse me, but apologies. I'm currently on vacation, he interrupted with a quizzical tone. Look, I don't want to take up your time, but I need to speak with Bruce McCoy right away. I've been discussing some important financial matters with him, and I need some more information. I stared at him eagerly, but he ignored my request and kept stirring his coffee, taking a drink here and there. 
they were starting to make it clear why they weren't able to move stuff, so I waited in stunned quiet for a second before speaking up again, but this time with more conviction. Uh, seriously? This is kind of important? So can you get him for me? At first he was very wary of me, but then a smile spread across his face. You're the guy who was in here earlier with Bruce, right? Hey, yeah, come on in. Bruce is meeting with a supplier right now, but you can wait in the break room for him if you want. I don't think he'll be too long, maybe a half hour at most. Afterwards, he walked me back to the room at a slow pace, leaving me with a coffee cup and the TV remote. In my hurriedly planned strategy, I was going to face Bruce directly and pretend to have proof that he and Olivia were cheating. If he didn't confess immediately, I would warn him that Mindy and the family would find out. I assumed that if Bruce was unfaithful to her, he would confess immediately. Otherwise, I would simply have to endure the shame. Perhaps I would pretend it was a joke. While I paced the room, I mentally prepared my speech, including the parts where I would mention having video or photos, or even go to the extreme and claim that Olivia had admitted. I started to glance around the room, involuntary, as I contemplated the impending confrontation. I decided to look around for hints after a brief perusal of the periodicals and television channels. Gradually, it dawned on me that this break room would be the perfect spot for them to cheat at the store. And if that were the case, they would most likely be utilizing the worn-out couch that I kept gazing at. I stared at the sofa for a couple of minutes, filled with a mix of wrath and fear. It looked like it had seen better days. It was faded pea green, had a few coffee stains, and a rip in the fabric on one sleeve. It belonged at a thrift store or rubbish yard. My pulse rate increased slightly as I lifted a cushion and noticed that it had a fold-out bed with sheets. I yanked open the bed after a brief check to make sure Bruce was still in his office. The linens were all over the place, wrinkled and unkempt, with a few of deeper yellowed patches where a wet spot from sex would be. The bed seemed to have one or two lipstick stains and had a slight perfume scent. As I peered beneath the couch, I noticed some debris on the floor. So I reached up and grabbed objects from the soiled carpet below by sticking my right arm into the area at the top of the bed. After some time, I managed to retrieve a pen, 37 cents and change, a broken coffee cup, a tube of key jelly that had been used up and a receipt from a restaurant. There, at the bottom of the receipt, was Olivia's signature, flowing, graceful, and incriminating. From a Mexican restaurant where she enjoyed lunch, I can see now that the receipt was only circumstantial evidence, and it would have been easy to find an explanation for it using any number of stories or excuses. Finding it, though, cleared the last remaining cloud from my memory and the nitpicky details about her bruises. Linger usage and Tuesday meeting schedules came together to paint a clear picture of a cheating wife and a jerk brother. All of a sudden, I regretted trying to blackmail Bruce into confessing. I was aware that a confrontation might cloud the evidence I needed to prove the affair, if not make it difficult to prove at all. Now that I knew when and where their infidelity was most likely to have occurred, I could probably collect the information, the evidence I needed to be sure. Furious, my heart pounding, and my jaw tightly clamped, I collapsed the bed and slumped into the sofa. In my life, I had never experienced anything even close to this level of treachery. I had been taken advantage of a few times in business agreements and even in a game of cards. At the same time that I was about to scream, cry, and smash my fist through the wall, I was also about to yell. But eventually, a single, intense longing emerged from this emotional whirlwind, the desire for vengeance. After a brief period of quiet, I began to assess my circumstances with an objective, dispassionate eye. Once I had indisputable evidence, I considered how I could take advantage of Bruce's and my wife's frailties to appease my battered pride. At first, I wanted to beat Bruce up, but in my imagination, it just led to jail time. 
I briefly considered turning down the loan and demanding quick repayment of all my outstanding balance. When I was thinking about securing financing from an aggressive bank, though, I recalled something Bernie had told me before. If you owed someone money, particularly someone who didn't care about you, he had you firmly grasped. He had warned you, so don't do it. I want Bruce's attention. Bruce was standing and shaking hands with the supplier when I glanced back to his office. After we exchanged smiles and waves, he escorted the supplier to the door and quickly made his way back to the break room. Hey Mike, did you forget something? Do you need some more info? Laughing, I shook my head. Listen, Bruce, I've thought this over and I want to say that maybe I gave the wrong impression earlier today. I really hope you understand that I think you're a great businessman and I think you've got a real winner here with this store. But as I was driving away, I realized that maybe I got across the wrong message when I asked about, well, about your contingency plans. If things didn't go the way you wanted, then he returned the smile. Oh no, Mike, I get it. Any good businessman would ask the hard questions. Great, great. I just want to be sure that you know that I really like what you're doing here. Plus, your family, and I have to feel like this wouldn't just be a safe investment. It's just the right thing to do for you as a friend, and a member of the family, as well as a good businessman. So, I didn't want you to go home without knowing for sure that I plan to push really hard to get this money for you, and I can't imagine we won't get it. Now, like I said earlier, I don't have that kind of coin in my personal accounts, so I'm going to have request a withdrawal from the trust fund. But frankly, I'm virtually certain I'll be able to make Bernie bend on this and we'll get the money for you. As I spoke, Bruce's eager expression widened as he listened. Oh man, that sounds great. I'm telling you, this business is right on the edge of taking off. So that loan is as safe with me as it is in the bank. You don't have to worry a bit. I'm not worried at all, Bruce. Bernie will have to draw up some sort of an agreement, of course, since he'll insist on protecting the trust with collateral and whatnot. I should be able to get things back for your signature within a few days. Unless you have a problem with it, I'll guess you'll have the cash within a week. I just showed up the following morning, slammed the door behind me, and collapsed into a chair in Bernie's office. Bernie, who was taking notes while on the phone, held up a single finger to signal that he would be available to chat soon. As he ended the call, I twitched uncomfortably, and he must have noticed since he regarded me with curiosity before asking, So, Mike, what's got you so nervous this morning? I lowered my head slightly and cleared my throat in order to speak. Bernie, I think I'm going to need to access the trust for a fairly large loan. I suppose that shouldn't be an issue then. What kind of loan would you like? And how much would it be? He used the mouse to wake up his computer and then clicked a few icons to bring up a spreadsheet that outlined the trust's assets. I coughed up a saliva and drew nearer. Look, Bernie, before we start doing the paperwork, the first thing I want from you is absolute confidentiality. Of course, I'm always. No, look, I want you to understand that this is unusual. And there may be a temptation to talk to Seth or someone else here at work or in the family. I don't want anybody other than you and me to understand what exactly I'm trying to do here. I answer was started, but he writhed in his chair, furrowed his brow and was hesitant. Ah, uh, Mike, if this is illegal, it's not illegal. Not at all. In fact, I want you to create a document that is the pinnacle of foolproof legality. While he tilted his head, I persisted. I want to loan some money. I want you to draw up the loan papers. I want the conditions of the loan to be very clear. I want the loan to be appropriately collateralized by the very business I'm planning on loaning it to. And I want the penalties for non-payment to be very, very clearly delineated. Sounds like you expect a default, like you want to trap the guy, more or less. So, who are you trying to trap and why? After a little pause, 
I finally spoke out and met his gaze. I want to trap my brother-in-law, Bruce. The why is Olivia. Surprisingly, he arched an eyebrow and half spoke in response before he finally shut his jaw. Last but not least, he reached for a bottle of water resting on his desk and coughed out. Are you, uh, sure about this? In response, I said, very, very. I personally delivered the completed paper to Bruce for his inspection and signature within a week of its inception. As a cousin, he had his diminutive and mustached lawyer, Tim Sowers, sit down with us to review the paperwork. Sowers began by saying, Okay, I looked this over last night and it's pretty much what I'd expect for a business-to-business -business loan. But there are a couple of things I want to point out here, Bruce, before you sign on, okay? Bruce, being himself, was behaving agreeably and naively while flashing his bland smile. Sure, let me have the info, Tim. I felt like I caught a whiff of scorn emanating from Sowers as he studied Bruce intently, as if he were aware of Bruce's abject lack of business acumen. Okay, first. This loan is for $425,000 to be paid back over seven years. You've got a fairly standard rate here. The payback will begin immediately at a little over six grand a month. The nod came from Bruce. Now, the actual amount of money you'll get is only $365,000 since we are consolidating this with your loan from a couple of years ago. Mike is going to get his $60,000 back and you'll be getting the rest. Okay? Capis, Bruce said with an air of superiority and a hint of Italian. Tim glanced back at him and let out a low groan. Okay, then. The loan is collateralized. It's tied to your business as well as a property over by Keokuk. Is that the duck hunt? While addressing Sowers, Bruce said, Oh, uh, yeah. He then gestured to Bernie. That won't happen. The business is doing great. I believe so. Bernie Black seems to think so. He smiled and nodded to me. And Mike definitely thinks so. Right, Mike? He then continued, but that's not going to happen. My response was an overly exuberant. Oh, yeah. Bruce showed me the books, and I think he's got a winner here. My face lit up. But, well, I don't know if you're familiar with Bernie or not, but he's very, very conservative and always considers the worst case scenario. He wants to be absolutely sure that the trust is protected. So it's important to him that if, for some impossible reason, the business collapses, there will be something else to reimburse that trust with. After furrowing his brow, Sowers fixed his intense gaze on Bruce. You understand that if you default, you could very well lose the business to the trust? Maybe even the duck hunting land? That's been in the family for a while. Sure. Bruce seemed to be attempting to show Sowers that he had fully grasped the warning and was treating it with the seriousness it deserved. I understand the, uh, ramifications. You bet. But, honestly, I'm very confident in the business, and I think it's a lot safer to take this loan than to try and run the business without it. You understand that in as little as three months of insufficient payment, the penalties start to kick in? Right. Right? With a smirk that betrayed our shared understanding, he said. Sure, I understand. It was as if he knew I would never let Bernie enforce punishment for anything less than the most serious infraction. To reciprocate, I merely grinned. When Olivia got home, she was ecstatic. She went on and on about how great things were going to be for Bruce's company, now that he had the capital to address the key issues. I almost said what I was about to say that Bruce was the biggest problem and that money couldn't solve it. But I restrained myself. For the following two weeks, however, being around Olivia made it nearly easy for me to refrain from commenting on Bruce's business acumen. My emotions, which fluctuated daily between sadness, anger, and disgust over thoughts of her affair, would have to be controlled if I planned to end my marriage the manner I wanted to because I needed additional knowledge and that would take some time. 
It became difficult to eat supper with her without getting angry, and I tried to postpone having sex whenever possible. When I was stuck, I had to remember a really unpleasant sexual encounter from years ago. For spring break, when I was 18 years old, a group of my friends and I drove all the way to San Diego. We went to Tijuana one night to let off steam. We ended up with some hookers after drinking and watching some very graphic, and to be honest, disgusting sex shows. I ended up paired with a woman in her early 30s who had obviously had a tough life. She was unattractive, and I'm sure she was even worse than I remember because my perception of beauty was certainly clouded by my high blood alcohol level. Despite my best efforts, I still had severe reservations about putting her to bed and came up with reasons not to. My friends, on the other hand, were quite critical of me, criticizing my sexual orientation, my manhood, and everything in between. I forced myself to put on an act, drank quickly, clenched my jaw, and followed her into a dark, unclean room above the bar, where we got down to business. Now, in order to accomplish the task at hand, I discovered that it was necessary to act as though she were inanimate, as if she were merely a sex object. Despite the noise, the cramped room, the unclean laundry, and the strange odor that came from her, I ended up just having sex with her. For the next two weeks, whenever Olivia and I had sexual intercourse, I envisioned her as that serial killer. I'd turn up my emotional nose, close my eyes, and hammer the same thing into her that I'd hammered into that poor Mexican woman all those years ago. Nothing tender, no affection, just a biological need. Olivia, unsurprisingly, took note of this shift and brought it up in conversation, expressing her desire for a more tender, romantic form of sex before we turned in for the night. However, she seemed to enjoy the pounding and even saw it as an improvement over our previous experiences. I suppose in a previous incarnation, she would have been well off taking advantage of the American visitors in Tijuana. It was almost as simple as I had anticipated to get irrefutable proof of the affair. There were a lot of people milling about the store all day, fixing things up since Bruce was using some of the money to undertake some minor renovations. On a Monday morning, approximately one month after receiving the funds from me, Bruce placed a camera and recording device in one of the can lights over the break room couch. I had the right idea that no one would notice until two days later, when the electrician with $500 in his back pocket took it out again. Since I thought I understood what Bruce and Olivia were up to, I was expecting to be ready for what the camera would show. Sitting in my office with a snack and a drink, I planned to observe it with as much objectivity as possible, like a movie. It turns out that knowing your wife is having an affair is bad, but actually witnessing it is even worse. Absolute nightmare. I had ruined my desk, vomited up twice, smashed a paperweight through the office door, consumed so much scotch that I couldn't possibly drive home by the time the tape ended. Everything is as expected in terms of the details. I fast, forwarded to Tuesday's early afternoon, and began watching relentlessly until I witnessed a woman in a blue outfit pulling out new sheets from a large tote bag and unfolding the couch. I quickly returned the recording to its original speed and confirmed, with a feeling of gloom, that the woman was, in fact, Olivia. She retrieved a bottle of wine and two glasses from the bag after changing the linens. While sitting on the edge of the bed, she removed her blue dress, carefully folded it, and set it in the bag. She then waited, wearing high thigh stockings, French, cut underwear, and an extremely C through bra to read a book. It was eerily unreal, and it brought to mind a peculiar performance art show I saw in New York City a while back, where a scantily clad young woman read out bizarre New Age poetry to an audience that appeared more interested in her breasts than the poetry itself. Olivia set her book down, grinned, and got to her feet to embrace Bruce as he finally entered the room. After that, she gave him a little shove and scolded him for making her wait. They laughed at what sounded like an old joke when he answered that her problem was that she couldn't wait to come. After a brief kiss, 
Olivia took hold of his belt, unbuttoned his pants, and pulled them down to his ankles. When I was with Olivia, it was very important that we both finish what we started. So, I was a little taken aback when they didn't, as they silently engaged in the alterations, each waiting for the next step. I got the impression that this was their normal routine. I sensed Olivia's entrance at the same time as Bruce's ecstasy, which came around the tenth minute. By the way, she threw her head back sharply. Bruce stayed inside her for a few moments as they lay in silence, but eventually he moved to his side, and they kissed for a while. I was more outraged and wounded than they were when they eventually finished, and I was breathing harder than them. I resolved then and there to never forgive the two cheats, because the images they had shown me had left an irreparable mark on my mind. Instead of trying to rescue my marriage, I was relieved to have a strategy to terminate it. As soon as I saw that they were having a pillow chat, I leaned forward to disable the video. As Bruce lay supine, Olivia laid on her side, her head propped up on her right elbow, and she lazily sketched designs on his chest. They smiled pleasantly and looked at each other, whispering quietly. The idea of using the furniture store as a makeshift love nest began to nag at Olivia subtly. Bruce got down on one knee and gave a response. Come on, Lev. If we use a hotel, we definitely leave a trail and we nearly got caught using either of our houses. There really isn't any option. Then Olivia just shrugged. I know. I know. But really, I wish we had another place to play. I just don't like this room and changing last week's dirty sheets before making love isn't particularly inspiring. Bruce smiled as he stretched out and gently patted her cheek. Well, we could always just run off together. In return, Olivia let out a laugh, which caused Bruce to look thoughtful, his grin beginning to fade. Seriously though, Liv, do you ever regret marrying Mike? I mean, I love Mindy, and she's a good wife, but sometimes, I don't know. Do you think it would have been better if maybe you and I had gotten married instead? Olivia shifted in her bed so that she was almost sitting up, with her knees pushed up to her breasts and her back resting on the couch. Before responding, she gave Bruce a long, contemplative look. Come on, Bruce. How many times do we have to go over this? What we have is special, very special. But no, I don't think it would have been better if we'd gotten married instead. We'd have been very happy together, of course, but I also love Mike and you love Mindy. If you and I were together, it would just be us. Mike is a very monogamous guy and he would never develop a relationship with me if I was married and I don't think Mindy would like it that way all that much either. While her right hand caressed Bruce's chest, she bent down and kissed him on the face. The truth is, Bruce, that people like you and I have a greater gift for love. We can love more than one person at a time, and we, we should love more than one person. It's right for us to do that. But Mindy and Mike aren't like that. Their inclination to limit themselves means that they'd never be able to do what you and I do. They'd never be able to keep their emotions straight and keep everyone satisfied. My wrath reached its height at that moment, and I threw my paperweight out the office door. I suppose I failed to recognize my wife's hubris, delusion, and self-serving nature because of my love for her, and perhaps because she was the sole woman who had ever loved me. To her, she had somehow elevated her dishonest behavior to the level of a virtue. Evidently, an act that increased the love in the world wasn't something that symbolized a stab in the back of her lawfully wedded husband to her, something that was both within her rights and her moral obligations. That night, I slept on a couch in my workplace and the following morning, I completed all the necessary papers. Olivia met me the following evening at my house with her hands crossed over her hips and a pouty expression on her face. Where the hell were you last night? I was worried sick. You didn't call. You didn't text. You gave me no clue whatsoever. What the hell? With a raised hand, I briefly halted her. I was at work last night. I got drunk and couldn't drive home. So I stayed there. She looked at me 
as if I were a complete alien. Wait, what? You got drunk? At work? She went on, and I just nodded and grinned. I was on the verge of contacting the authorities when she asked, Well, you could have informed me about what was going on. And, what were you doing drinking at work? She maintained her intense gaze while asking, her inquiry betraying her profound confusion. I walked past her unresponsively into the living room, where I collapsed onto the couch, put my feet up on the coffee table, and opened my briefcase. As we made our way into the living room, Olivia sighed in frustration and sat down furiously in a chair across from the sofa. Hey, how about some answers, Mike? Sure thing. I don't understand why you drank so much while on the clock. Hey, remember yesterday night? What's happening? As I proceeded to go through my briefcase, I removed a few folders and placed them on the couch next to me, one by one. Excuse me, Liv, but I need a moment to gather these documents. I leaned forward, took my feet off the table, and rearranged them among the pile of paperwork. With a ritualistic hand-rubbing motion, as if in anticipation of a delicious dinner, I glanced over at Olivia and grinned. Okay, let's get started. What? Begin now. Yes. Well, after last night's experience, just last night. What transpired during the evening? I could feel a hint of anxiety beginning to creep into Olivia's demeanor, as her previously belligerent demeanor was swiftly giving way to something more subdued whenever I returned home. At the very least, could you fill me in on what you did last night? Excuse me? A video caught my attention. So what? Yeah. I was a little tipsy because I was watching the broadcast of you and Bruce having sex on the couch in his break room, and I thought it was a little weird, you know. As I returned Olivia's thin, emotionless smile, her expression shifted from puzzlement to distress and finally to shock, fear, and bewilderment. Olivia's jaw moved in tiny spasmodic movements, barely opening and closing. But she couldn't make a sound, and her eyes darted from the papers on the table to the door and back to me, as if she were expecting someone or something to come in and fix everything. Eventually, she spoke. Mike, I just don't get it. Please, tell me again what you're referring about. Olivia, hurry up. You must not be very smart. I pointed to the papers on my desk and said, I'm talking about the end of our marriage. I continued, I'm talking about you and Bruce and what you two did yesterday and every other Tuesday for at least a year. I waited for Olivia to say anything, but she gasped out of the blue and briefly covered her lips with her palm. We can figure this out, Mike. It seems like I can explain it to you. After retrieving a DVD from its container, I slid it across the table toward Liv and said, Oh, I think I understand Liv. I had gathered a lot of material last night that would help me comprehend. An absolute treasure trove of fresh information regarding my wonderful wife and my amiable brother-in-law. She recoiled slightly, staring at the DVD as if it were a dangerous snake, and she made zero attempt to take it up. All right, Liv. I'll give you that copy. I will keep it a secret from you, but I have mine saved for when I need it and so that I can learn more about your views on love and commitment. She got to her feet and began to stand as if to approach me. However, I reached out and stopped her, and she sat back down. After a brief moment of biting her lip, she looked directly at me and resumed speaking, this time more slowly and deliberately, exuding an air of fake confidence that I assume was an attempt to mask the trembling in her voice. Listen, Mike, you need to put this in perspective and think about it. Since we have different priorities, interests, skills, and values, it would be counterproductive for you to destroy our lives. Although we have our differences, I love you and have always been willing to work with you to find a solution. I pray that. Interrupting with a mocking snort, I ask different values and talents. Liv, I'm pretty sure everyone is guilty of cheating on their husbands, so I don't see why you believe it's a talent. Capacity. I think the right word is capacity. I have a great capacity for love, 
and I can and have successfully loved more than one person romantically at a time. Other than outdated conventions about love and relationships, there is no reason that I can't or shouldn't exercise my capacity. She looked up from her desk for a second before returning her gaze to me. Talent is wrong. Please stop. Honestly, you're just wearing me out with your excuses. I get that you think you have some special ability that gives you the right to cheat and lie and sleep around when you're supposed to be faithful. But really, that's just a bad excuse, Liv. Anyone can have romantic relationships with more than one person at a time. That doesn't make them lovers with more ability. It just makes them a cheater. The remorseful, accommodating Olivia vanished in an instant, replaced by a fierce, aggressive, and utterly confident shrew. You accuse me of being unfaithful? She spat out at me. Well, I suppose I am, from your perspective. However, let me remind you that my love for you and Bruce has never been diminished or repressed. As a result, I have never cheated on my emotions or compromised my feelings or actions in order to conform to some medieval code that states I must limit my relationships to one person. So yes, I may appear unfaithful to you, but when I look into the mirror, I am completely comfortable with what I see. I have no regrets about what I've done, none. Her breathing was rapid and passionate, her face and chest flushed, and her eyes blazed with a look that dared me to challenge her. Thus, I went ahead and did it. Is that how you want to live your life? Some loose relationship with lots of different guys? Loving one guy one day and another guy the next? I respect that, but pretending you haven't cheated or been dishonest is completely untrue. You never once told me you slept with Bruce, and you know full well I wouldn't go for it. You know that? She felt my heat and tried to avoid my gaze, but I turned to her so that my eyes met hers and continued. So you chose to lie by omission, the greatest omission of truth I've ever encountered. You made me and pretty much everyone else think we were a couple a couple bound exclusively to each other. But you went off and started or continued to have sex with Bruce, hiding your cheap furniture store adventures as best you could. You told lies. You lived a lie. And no matter what kind of weird marital philosophy you have, that makes you a cheater. She was visibly upset by this point, with tears streaming down her cheeks and her jaw tightly clamped. She was more irate than sad and she was slowly shaking her head in disapproval of what I had said, though she seemed to be at a loss for words. I waited for a reaction from her, but when I got none, I broke the impasse by moving the document closer to her. Read it. Get a lawyer. It's fair. At last, she spoke. And if I don't want a divorce, well, I'm sorry to hear that, Liv, but you're going to have to deal with one. I took a brief minute to compose myself before continuing. But hey, you won't be alone. That night, I packed up my belongings and headed for a new apartment closer to my workplace. But I wasted no time getting back to my old self after losing Olivia, someone who is busy with job and business and doesn't have much time or interest in hanging out with others. A lot of people saw how many hours I was working and thought it was terrible. However, I was well aware that if I remained indoors, my thoughts would go to Olivia and her affair. I would constantly worry if she was considering me or if she was having an intimate encounter with Bruce. Getting out of my marriage as fast as possible was my only option, so I dove headfirst into my career. Most people who knew me in business would have anticipated a protracted combative negotiation to achieve a settlement as that is my usual tendency in any kind of competition. For the sake of speed and cleanliness, I was prepared to pay the price of delay, interaction, and discomfort. I threatened to withdraw my offer of continuous assistance and a huge lump amount to Olivia unless she agreed to a fast divorce. I suppose in my heart, I hoped she would disagree that we could find a way to salvage the marriage, reject the proposal, and fight for our union. I hoped that she would prioritize the marriage's tenuous prospects over financial concerns. 
It wasn't, as it turned out. My marriage ended 60 days later, after she reluctantly consented to the terms, despite her reservations. Several months following the divorce's finalization, Bruce, as expected, began to fall behind on his payments. After receiving the necessary cautions, he received a nasty letter from Bernie informing him that we would begin to take the money in any manner possible. Subtly pleading for further time to pay, he contacted via phone and email, offering justifications and assurances. Bernie was told to play hardball, and we both agreed to use our rights and start collecting collateral as soon as it was possible under the law. I consented to Bruce's request that we meet face to face on the night before a workout session. I could tell he was about to throw in the towel because he was willing to do everything, even steal from complete strangers to keep the wolves at bay. It was my hope that Olivia would be the one to provide the funding. My anticipation for the meeting was high. We had an after hours meeting in my office. Although most of the secretaries had already left for the day, my pa, Sherry, remained in the outside office to be prepared to handle any paperwork that may be required. Bruce trembled into my office, his nerves showing more than I'd ever seen before. He shook my hand, his palm damp with perspiration. Olivia was lurking behind him, almost timidly, and I was taken aback by her sight. There was little doubt in my mind that Olivia was there to attempt to strengthen Bruce's prospects by appealing to my past emotional ties. She sat closer to me than to Bruce, wore one of my favorite clothes and flashed her radiant smile. Knowing the danger of giving in to my desires, I brutally repressed the need to go up to her, embrace her and kiss her. Instead, I resorted to making a scowl face and grumpily acknowledging her existence. I must admit that I was slightly taken aback by her arrival. I'd been planning this meeting for what felt like an eternity, but I wasn't expecting Olivia to show up, and I was scared that her presence might derail my scheme to tie her to her lover's shortcomings. After giving it some thinking, I realized that having her there would possibly make the result more satisfying, so I refrained from complaining or even demanding that she wait outside. Bruce began by making an effort to woo me. He shook my hand, grinned broadly, and then began to make small chat about his desire to put things right, his want for me to be happy, his hope that I understood his regard for me and his sorrow for the way things had turned out. I couldn't believe he seemed interested in getting back together with us, as if we might be friends again. I had second thoughts. I looked him dead in the eyes and cut off his short speech as coldly as possible, not even flinching. Bruce, please cut this. Your apologies are meaningless to me, okay? He leaned back in his chair as if I had hit him. He tied his lips together, inhaled deeply through his nose, and nodded to show his agreement before starting over. Fine. I'm sorry, Mike. Let's get down to business. He gave me the silent treatment, as if this were our meeting, as if he believed I should take the lead, but I simply held out my hands in a hopeful gesture waiting for him to elaborate. Despite his best intentions, he was temporarily unable to repay the loan, so he anxiously licked his lips and ran a quivering hand through his hair before continuing to babble. He said Bernie was being quite demanding, and he didn't think I understood the amount of pressure he was using to get him to pay. Next, he proceeded to explain that the company was set to make a comeback and that he would be able to pull himself up by the bootstraps in short order. Lastly, he attempted to convince me that my financial situation would improve if I extended his deadline. As I sank into my chair, I watched Bruce's anxious grin, the bead of perspiration forming on his forehead, and the unsteady shaking of his right palm as it landed on the table across from us. Bruce, if you weren't an outright boor, I'd consider giving you a reprieve. He was about to object when I raised my hand to stop him. His eyes were widened with shock and distress. Come on, Bruce. You have to realize that it's almost impossible to trust a man who slept with his married sister-in-law without thinking. You have to realize that asking for financial help from that same woman's husband is ridiculous. Olivia nervously cleared her throat 
and intervened with a mournful voice while Bruce fidgeted uncomfortably in his chair. Mike, please, you can't punish Bruce because... I am absolutely free to do as I please, Olivia, I said angrily, casting her an unforgiving glance. And just why are you here anyway? I thought I could win you over for the sake of keeping you in the loop. I still care about you, and I thought that. I spoke to her and suddenly interrupted her. You were mistaken. Honestly, your presence only reminds me of how you and Bruce just betrayed me. So do yourself and Bruce a favor. Sit back and try to look pretty, and keep your comments to an absolute minimum. Her chin frowned, and tears came to her eyes but she complied with my request and leaned back in her chair quietly. Bruce was my center of attention again. Oh, Bruce, so this is the way it's going to be. You're going to pay back on time, on a strict schedule, or I'll start going through a workout process to get what I can out of the collateral assets. Bruce was making a very angry motion with his head. Come on, Mike. You can't take my business from me. You can't. I can and I will if you don't pay, Bruce. My advice is to get the money. Look to your family. Find a bank. Sell something. I don't care. Just get the money or I'll take what I can. But, 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 but. You know the banks aren't loaning to me or I would have gone to them in the first place. And my family, they can't help. They don't have that kind of dough. Bruce met my unwavering gaze. You don't have to tell me your family doesn't have money. I know they do. No, no, they don't. They would help if they could, but they just can't. What about her? I asked, quickly shifting my thumb to Olivia. Have you asked her for money? Bruce took a seat. Leave? Liv doesn't have. That made me giggle. Sure she does. I cut her a check for 150 grand. She's got plenty of money. Don't you, Olivia? I gave Olivia a sideways grin, and Bruce gave her a curious glance. I was right. He had no idea about the lump sum payment. All of a sudden, she appeared anxious, almost sick to her stomach. Well, yes, I do, but, but I need that money. This time, I found myself laughing out loud. My goodness, Liv, when you first convinced me to lend Bruce money, you said it was a safe investment. I remember that, so why wait? You must be kidding me if you don't think Bruce can save his company here. Don't you think it's your job to persuade me that he's worth it financially? Why wouldn't you consider it a worthwhile investment if you think it's beneficial for me? I was grinning at her with an evil, anticipatory grin. She took a deep breath, glanced across at Bruce, and then returned her attention to me. After a long inhalation, she straightened her back and declared, in an almost rebellious tone, that she could more than make up the shortfall for the time being. Bruce walked away from her with a bit more self-assuredness, and Olivia, with her shoulders, slumped in disappointment after they exchanged a faint smile. I had one final caution for them as I held the door open for them. I am indifferent to the method, Bruce. The money is all I really need. You'll get your money. He pummeled me in return. Olivia appeared concerned. I persisted in seeking comfort in my job for the following few months. I maintained my business-like demeanor and efficiency while avoiding any form of personal discussion. I would rather work alone or avoid social situations altogether. Every little thing, even the monthly check from Bruce, came across my desk, and I couldn't help but think of my wife and her treachery and betrayal. A bittersweet thrill washed over me as I cashed in on the check. It was as if I had succeeded in bringing the people responsible for my suffering down into hell with me. When Mindy contacted me, things took a turn for the worse. She contacted me by phone and email multiple times. It came as a bit of a shock to me to hear that Bruce and Olivia had confessed to her, probably with a diluted version of their affair, and that she had taken it very badly at first, but had forgave them both in the end. She made a nebulous suggestion, which shocked and disappointed me, 
that she had suspected they were lovers and had worked out a plan whereby Bruce and Olivia could keep seeing each other. Even more disappointing was her feeble effort to persuade me to think about reuniting with Olivia. By the conclusion of the second call, I was very sure I had left her in tears due to my caustic and hasty responses. After that, she stopped contacting me. The emotional cost to Bruce and Olivia was significantly lower than I had anticipated, as Mindy's apparent tolerance made quite plain. Now, my worst nightmare was that the store would magically become profitable. Bruce would repay Olivia and pay off his debt, and they would all be happy with the outcome. Financially and emotionally, that everyone would abandon me, and they would all shake their heads at the wretched old man who had no idea what love was in this day and age. My fears were unfounded. Nine months subsequent to my encounter with Bruce and Olivia, the furniture that was kept in storage was destroyed in a fire. The fire was a stunning too, alarm job that loomed over the nightly news and endangered nearby buildings. Bernie contacted me right away to talk about the story's implications, as he had seen it before I did. Since he was convinced the trust had thrown away a significant sum of money, he was furious with me for accepting the risk. I reassured him that the properties were valuable due to their location alone, and I also offered to personally pay off the debt in the event of default. This appeased him. The insurance company promptly declined to pay out after discovering accelerants, and the inquiries regarding the fire were straightforward. Because the business wasn't making any money, Bruce went into default on the loan, and I ended up with a lot that was in disrepair and 35 acres of Mississippi duck hunting territory. For almost six months, the police probed the crime. With the use of circumstantial evidence, the investigators were able to build a solid case against Bruce and Olivia. They could prove that Olivia was paying ever, increasing amounts each month to keep the store going while it was losing money. After multiple, unsuccessful attempts to secure funding from other sources, Bruce secretly launched a final effort to sell the company. However, not even at a severe discount were any purchasers found. Although the detectives failed to find any proof that Olivia or Bruce were in the vicinity of the store, on the night of the fire, or had anything that could have started or accelerated the fire, their case rested on the notion that they had hired a professional to set fire to the store. According to their findings, Olivia's home computer had multiple searches that included the word arson. Additionally, their analysis of her phone records revealed that she had communicated with two individuals who had arson convictions, and it was discovered that she had withdrew 15 grand in cash just one week prior to the fire. Olivia and Bruce had decent lawyers, perhaps paid for with what little money she had left, and the district attorney anticipated a confrontation and began to mediate. It seems like they began with allegations of first-degree arson and fraud, and worked their way down. The defense was firm in their demand for fourth-degree arson, thus a court date was scheduled and a game of chicken ensued. I was waiting outside the foyer on the first day of the trial as one of the witnesses. A court official emerged from the courtroom to announce that the trial had been postponed, that they had finally reached an agreement, and that we may all return home. I sat on a rough wooden bench, read the paper, and tapping my foot absent-mindedly on the tile floor. Just as I was finishing packing ready to go, Olivia and Bruce walked through the doorway, followed by a couple of cops and their lawyer. Despite a couple of reporters shoving microphones under their noses, the subjects chose not to react, and the spotlight was instead shown on their lawyer. While Mindy and Bruce departed the room with a few officers, Olivia glanced in my direction and approached me to speak without hesitation. She must have had a lot of guts to face me in those situations. Is today a good day for you, Mike? Is this the punishment you had in mind for all my transgressions? In a mocking manner, I shook my head and chuckled bitterly. I wished for a devoted spouse and a prosperous union. Your response to my request was always going to be negative. In its absence, all I want was payment. She gave me the evil eye. Well, you aren't getting any of that now, are you? Oh, I got some of it back and I've got the store. 
laughter escaped her lips. And how are you going to put that to use? Is it still smoking? You'd be surprised what a competent businessman can do with a good piece of property, even a smoking one. Her nose drooped and her expression became somewhat more serious. She drew a long breath and waited a second before continuing. And you're feeling better now? On my own? Is it alone? Committed to your job indefinitely? With a knowing smirk, she looked at me. It's true. I know you. Going out and meeting new people is something you find incredibly repulsive. And I get that. Listen up, Liv. I'm on the case. I cared for you, but I also want you to know that there are other women in the world. She beamed with self-assurance. Absolutely not. However, I am of the opinion that you will not be successful in locating a... What do you business people term it? Exactly the same thing. You will miss me, regardless of how you feel about it. I knelt down beside her and spoke something softly. I may feel lonely, but I guarantee you won't feel lonely. On the plus side, you'll be living in close quarters with a group of women, so you can share your lavish love with them, and everyone will benefit from it. My last remark suddenly enraged Olivia, and she backed away from me as if I were radioactive. Her expression was contempt, and her eyes glittered with rage. She took several long breaths, her chest heaving violently, twice before she lost her temper. You sanctimonious, self-centered, emotional midget idiot. As the cops dragged her from me toward the exit, she let out a shriek. Like me, you'll end up at the bottom. Sold out herself. Married to your job. A flood of sadness washed over me as I watched her yell at me, realizing that her love for me had entirely faded, leaving only a scornful animosity. Refraining from reacting in a way that would reveal my pain, I forced myself to grin thinly and said something in response to her publicly harsh language. However, she persisted in her tirade as if I hadn't spoken a word. I'll be free and moving on from my prison cell in no time, but you'll remain here all by yourself hoping I could take you with me. When you're married to a dull ex-secretary a few years down the road, you'll wish you'd just accepted. Her tirade was cut short as the door slammed shut on her. Leaving the courthouse, I pivoted and proceeded to leave. I walked to the burned-out lot and reflected on my life since my afternoon was free for the trial and I didn't have any appointments or meetings. I was also struggling with an increasing feeling of melancholy and isolation. I stared about, still thinking about what I could do with the debris while the temperature fell and the wind whipped my jacket and burned my face. The thought of trying to fix things occurred to me, but I was also inclined to just sell it, move on from the disappointment, and continue doing what I had always done. It was the prudent and perhaps even the safest course of action to take. Yet I was aware that an alternate choice existed. It would be an adventure for me to start over, perhaps even open a new furniture store, it occurred to me that I could try my hand at furniture sales from the very spot where Bruce had failed. I considered bringing it to a glitzy public spectacle with plenty of billboards, advertisements, and other promotional materials that neither Bruce nor my ex would be able to ignore. I might go so far as to call it Olivia's and hold numerous fire sales to really drive the point home. The choices I would be making with the lot seemed a lot like the ones I had been making with my life, subconsciously. It turned out Olivia was correct about me. Before I met her, my only social inclination was to isolate myself, stay away from risky relationships, and focus on my career. A life of financial security, but little happiness seemed destined for me as I sank further into my inevitable decline, into oblivion. Once again, I was reverting to my old habits and doing what seemed secure. While I continued to think about my future and the choices I had, I sat down on a concrete block and looked about again. I wanted to change and be different, but I was afraid of letting go of the routines that had defined me and helped me succeed. I was just about to get back to my desk, give things some time to settle and postpone making a decision until another day when a beam of light 
Afternoon sunlight peeked through the clouds and buildings across the street, casting light on a graffiti covered wall. Both the concrete and the calligraphy took on an ethereal appearance when the light reflected off the wall in a burned orange hue. The text was legible and presented in large white letters. Go for it. I've always thought superstitious people were foolish for letting signs or habits dictate their lives based on little, objectively insignificant things. The words seemed like a divine message as I sat on a chilly slab of concrete in November. My assistant was summoned when I reached for my cell phone and dialed the office number. The new mall that was all the news was designed by which architecture company? Sherry, the one with the fountains and all the glass. Ah, uh, mm, hammer, something, I think. For a few moments, she checked while softly humming to herself. Hammerstone, I agree. It appears that they are based in Chicago. Okay, look, could you set me up with a meeting as soon as possible? For an instant, she paused. Are we? Well, who? Building something? I felt a burst of self-assurance as I surveyed the lot, mentally imagining the new store. Yes, yes, I think we. I think I am. Very well. Understood, sir. Is there anything more in particular you need? As I briefly bit on my lip, my gaze returned to the graffiti across the street, where the phrase go for it was written once more. Yeah, Sherry, I've got something else to tell you. Do you remember Brenda? The tall blonde girl who represents those fake jeans? Dear Brenda White, I believe. Yes. The more shocked Sherry sounded, the more I wondered if she believed I was going to have a nervous breakdown. Can you get her number for me? Yes, of course, boss. Am I to contact her on your behalf? Oh, no. No, I'll be the one to call. I am grateful.